morning. It's great to have everybody here this morning, and uh, it's, it's great to have all the conversations going on around us. It's, uh, it's awesome to be back together and uh, to be able to greet one another, and so welcome to Faith Fellowship Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Just a few announcements to go through. Just a reminder that um, once you're up and walking around, masks need to be worn. Uh, bathrooms, uh, no more than two people at a time if you're not from the same household. Also, women's ministry will be starting on September 15th at 10 a.m. from 10 to 11. And apparently there's a survey going around to the women, so if you've gotten that survey, please fill it out and return it to the church office. Uh, men, we've been meeting in Amen at 6 o'clock Tuesday mornings. We've been meeting in here, but this coming Tuesday we're moving back to the fellowship hall and uh, Rick Williamson is bringing donuts. So, um, so just so you know, donuts are back in vogue as of this Tuesday. Uh, also, you know, college and career this morning, we meet at 8.15 on Sunday mornings via Zoom. Uh, we had over 20 join us this morning. There's a WeChat group. We'd love to, as if you haven't been participating in your college and career age, or if you're recently just graduated from high school, We'd love to have you join in with us. It's, it's been a great time, and we're going through resolving conflict. Youth group, uh, the first and third Sundays of each month from 6 to 8 o'clock, starting, at, starting uh, Sunday, September 6th. And then if you're interested in becoming a uh, member, committed broken servant here at Faith Fellowship Church, if you would uh, call 759-6632, email ffc at faithfellowship.us, or reach out to John Hancock or one of us as elders. And then uh, last announcement, uh, you know, singing is, we don't have the space in order to sing inside, so we haven't been, but next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a time of just singing. It's going to be outside, so uh, mark that on your calendars next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Good morning, church. I want to remind you today that our music, our praising, it's a way of expressing our joy, our thankful heart. So we come today to play our instruments, but I want to encourage you today, don't let this moment just pass by. Take a moment, read the verses that will appear on the wall. I pray that those Bible verses will speak to our hearts. And we have the moment to meditate. We have a great opportunity to come together and praise the Lord from, bottom, from the bottom of our hearts. And let's just let our soul bless our Lord. Amen.
that the words, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, worship his holy name. And so as we continue, you know, we think about worship, uh, we have the opportunity to give. And just a reminder, the offering box is in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, it's my left, I don't know. I guess you're looking at me to be your right. It's, it's at the back in the middle row is where the offering box is. But um, and just, you know, as, as I think about that, that blessing, and as we're studying through the book of Acts, just wanted to look at Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. You know, as we prepare to, you know, to just pray together this morning and think about the giving, you know, that, that would be the prayer that there isn't a needy person. If there is a need, please reach out and let us know. And, uh, and if there's a need even within the community, you know, that, that we can meet that need and that we can be that light uh, to this community and how we reach out to others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, dear Lord we do thank you for the time that we have together this morning to worship you. And you know, the format of the worship may be different, but I pray that the hearts are the same, that our hearts are overflowing with gratitude to you for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, for what you've done for us on the cross at Calvary. We thank you, dear Lord, that uh, uh, in spite and as we look and study the New Testament church, there was certainly turmoil that swirled around them. But yet we read here there was that unity of focus. And, and may we have that same unity, dear Lord, as we focus on you and focus on glorifying you and proclaiming you to those around us. We do thank you, dear Lord, for the work that you've done and that you continue to do in this local body. And we just, uh, again, pray that we would be uh, that light, that city on a hill that you've called us to be. We do pray for those needs within the body. We continue to pray for Phil and, and dear Lord, just pray for his needs, not just you know, the, the physical healing, but also as far as uh, providing housing for um, when he is released. And we pray for Mark Setlock, just pray for healing there, uh, that he would be able to come home. Continue to pray for Noel, dear Lord, and just, uh, just pray for the treatments and just pray for his vision and pray that he would not grow discouraged. And we think of... Um, Shirley Tibor, just pray for her recovery and, and dear Lord, just uh, for healing there and for Sally Clayton with uh, the procedure that she has coming up this week. You know, we thank you, dear Lord, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that uh, you are the creator. We pray for those ministers at ministries. I think of the choice as ministry and just thank you for the open house they had yesterday and the work that they're doing. And we just pray for the Harrises as missionaries in Popeye and just pray for, you know, what's going on there as far as um, health concerns and, and, and just how it impacts the ministry. We just, uh, you know, just pray that you would continue to use them to reach the people there. And we do pray for those in leadership over us. We pray for our president and for our vice president. We pray that you would grant them wisdom, dear Lord. We pray for our governor. And we, we think of those even, you know, at, at, uh, within the county, within our towns. And, and we pray, dear Lord, that um, we would be faithful in praying for them. And that also that we as a people, uh, dear Lord, would take the opportunities to um, intervene not just in prayer, but any opportunity we have, dear Lord, to uh, 
within, whether it be, because I, I, especially at the local level, within conversations, uh, to be an encouragement, uh, but also to proclaim you. And again, we just uh, thank you for our time together this morning. And we pray that our worship would be pleasing to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I like this. I'm just going <laughs> to see what that is. <laughs> well, good morning. Yeah. It's good to see you, and it's, it's good to be up front because I get to see you without your masks on, so we can see that you're smiling and, and uh, enjoying being here. So uh, it's good to see uh, so many of you, and it's good to have some visitors. I know some folks I don't know, so you're a visitor. Uh, we hope to soon to be a friend. Uh, so by that, my, my name is Rick Williams, and I, I serve as one of the elders here in uh, I just am enjoying the other elders and their preaching and their teaching, and so I have the privilege to do uh, that the, the next two weeks, uh, so we're glad uh, that you have joined us. Uh, I did want to just say a couple things. Uh, number one, I just want to thank uh, those that uh, served um, faithfully and sacrificially in helping Maria Bell with her move to her new apartment. Uh, I don't have to name your names. Uh, God knows who you are, but we had some men, some young men. We appreciate you taking that Saturday and, and doing that. 
Uh, it was a real encouragement uh, to Maria, uh, to the people in the agency that she works with and her, and her aides to see the church that uh, would love on her. Uh, just for the drivers uh, that doing that, we just we appreciate your, your serving the body that way. Um, and I want to just I want to commend you, parents, uh, for being here with uh, your children. Uh, uh, it's a joy to have them in here with us. Uh, um, they're not a distraction to me at all. Uh, we might hear a little few extra noises, but uh, it is well worth it to have you all here uh, together. And so it's it's uh, I've been blessed by seeing the families here and sitting together. Uh, with your children. But with that in mind, uh, I would ask that you continue to pray for us as elders and the deacons as we continue to discuss as how we move forward and, and adding children's ministry and, and Wednesday nights and whatever else. We, we want to be wise and discerning in that. We want to meet the needs of the body. We don't want to overwhelm us, uh, but we certainly want to accommodate the needs and be able to teach and preach and present the gospel to the adults, to the children, uh, to the youth and whoever. Uh, so, uh, uh, Thank you for your patience, but just pray for us to have that wisdom to make the right choices to meet your needs. And I want to let you know that the elders continue to, we want to make ourselves available to you to talk about these things and what, you know, what, what would concern you or what would be beneficial to you and your family or you as an individual. So please feel that you can approach us at any time or meet with us at any time uh, that we can certainly address that. So please uh, pray for that. I was uh, reminded this, uh, this past week, uh, Abraham Lincoln is my grandson Jacob's favorite uh, president. And uh, we, we all know that he's famous for a number of speeches. Probably the most famous is his Gettysburg Address that he gave in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at a dedication of a cemetery there for many of the soldiers who had died in battle. And I was reminded that that speech, that famous speech that is quoted so often, was less than 300 words long and took less than three minutes to speak. And since I'm not Abraham Lincoln, don't get your hopes up <laughs> this morning. <laughs> uh, um, because I've been accused of going too long sometimes in, in my speaking. I, I was, uh, you know, one time I came into the church in the morning, I had cut myself shaving, I had the tissue paper on my face, and as I came in, one of the elderly women came up to me and said, you know, what happened? And I said, well, I was concentrating so much on my message this morning that I cut myself shaving and she politely said well maybe you should concentrate more on your shaving and cut your sermon <laughs> so so here we are <laughs> no that's not true I, I would never cut my sermon <laughs> um, so but we're continuing our study in the book of Acts the church on fire and as we get to Acts chapter 8 we certainly see things begin to heat up. And I would entertain that Acts chapter 8 is actually a, a turning point, uh, a fulfillment, if you would, of the Great Commission uh, from Jesus Christ. And I'll explain that in a minute. We'll look at that, you know, what, what I mean by that. But just to get our brain juices flowing here, I, I'll, I'll ask this question. You kind of think through it to yourself. Uh, no shout outs, no phone of friends right now. What did, um, if, if you had to describe the church using one word, what might that one word be? To describe the church, to define the church, what, what would that be? You know, it might be a noun, it might be a verb, it might be an adjective. But, but I, I, would, I would give you a hint. What, 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 is, what is the book of Acts been when focusing on? What, what, what is this that describes or defines the church? Because we've gone through a number of these uh, words uh, already. We'll continue to do that. And possible things like unity, love, uh, sharing, just as Steve just spoke about, sacrifice, Serving, miracles, the Holy Spirit, boldness, leadership, miracles, missions. I mean, persecution, it goes on and on. Of these just one words we might think of that really define what the church was and is. I would suggest that all these words apply, but there, there's another word that could be used even either in the noun or the verb form, form that, that really defines us even more, and that word is witness. The word is witness. And so the title of our message this morning is The Witness of the Church. The Witness of the Church. And this is just part one as we go through uh, verses 1 through 25 of Acts chapter 8. And we'll see how it flows into next week, uh, part two, as we continue <clears throat> Excuse me, to talk about the witness of the church. So with that, let's, let's pray as we look in 
to God's Word. Father, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the privilege to be your people, to be called to be your people, and then to be able to fellowship, to worship, to be together, to share together, to, to sit under the, the teaching of your word. And, and Father, I, I pray that you would have our full attention this morning, even beginning with me as I speak, that, Father, we are sensitive to who you are and to the work of the Holy Spirit of God and to the truth of your word. So, Father, I pray that you would confront me. I pray that you would confront each and every one of us with, with the truth of your word and what it means to be the witness of the church. So, Father, bless the time we have together. Open up the eyes of our understanding to know you more, to know your truth more, that, Father, we might obey, that we might flesh this out, that we might be that the living church, that, that organism this week, wherever we go, for your glory and for your kingdom. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you would, turn all the way back to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Because it is really interesting. I, I mean, God is smart. Does, I don't know what it, it just in his wisdom, his sovereignty, and his creativity, and in his, in his power, just I'm overwhelmed the more and more I learn and see how, how, how God is wise. All wise. And so in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, it's the last book of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, um, if you don't know that. So it's kind of interesting that the Hebrew Scriptures end this way. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, just let me read the, 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 the last two verses, verses 22 and 23. In Second Chronicles, and Chronicles is it's a historical narrative, a, a record, if you would, much like Luke's record uh, that we're reading here in the book of Acts. And we're not sure the writer it could be Ezra, but we read this: Second uh, Chronicles, chapter twenty-six, verses twenty-two and twenty-three. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he also put it in writing, saying this. Verse 23. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with you, <clears throat> and let him go up. So, here, so in this conclusion of this Old Testament historical record of Israel and the Israelites, the Jewish nation, they're, they're called, they're, getting, they're commanded to go back to Jerusalem. So if you would just flip over the next page or to the next book here, to the book of Ezra, we read almost the same thing. A little bit more defined. Ezra chapter 1, I'll just read the first four verses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jerob might be fulfilled, the Lord stood up the, stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord of God has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you, all of his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods, livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus the king gives this command and encourages all the people of, uh, uh, of uh, Israel to return now to Jerusalem. And we'll build this house, this place of worship, uh, where God has brought us back. And so, this is the conclusion of the, this, the, the Babylonian captivity and the dispersion or the diaspora of, of the Jews. And remember, they were, they were dispersed because of their disobedience to God. They actually became, because of their disobedience, they, they were scattered abroad. They were dispersed from Jerusalem, from Judah. And they became in, in captivated and enslaved by these other cities, these, these you know, um, ungodly cities and, 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 and nations. And they were always in bondage. They had no place to call their own. 
So now we get to 2 Chronicles and Ezra here, the, the end of the historical record, the end of the Hebrew Bible, and we read that God is calling them back. He's drawing them back. He's sending these displaced Jews back to Jerusalem to build the house of God where they will worship. So their bondage, their persecution comes to an end as they return to Jerusalem. So why is this so important to know? Uh, if you caught what I read there that said that the word of the uh, prophet Jeremiah might be fulfilled, why is this so important to know? We, we serve a covenant-keeping God, don't we? God is faithful. God was never out of control when the Jews, his people, Israel, were dispersed. God remained sovereign. It was part of his sovereign plan and purposes, and now it's in his time to draw them back, to bring them back. And so we, we never want to forget the, the, the covenant of God, that he is faithful. Even in the midst of a hopeless situation, when his people are enslaved, when his people are, are under persecution and bondage and oppression, God is sovereign. He is faithful. Even when his people are faithless. And sometimes I see myself that same way. I don't know if you do. That God is always faithful, even when I'm faithless, even when I question, even when I doubt, even by, when by my own choices I become under bondage and enslaved and captive to, to something else. God remains faithful. And so what we're going to see is this, this work of God, this plan of God is, is like a pendulum. His people have been dispersed. And now he's drawn them back, he's calling them back to, to Jerusalem to have a place of their own to worship. And now he's going to have this, this church, this ecclesia, a people called out from the world. But as we get to the book of Acts, we're going to be seeing that now Christ is going to send them out. He's brought them back to Jerusalem, and now his people, he's going to send them out. They're going to be dispersed again, but for a different reason in, in a different way. And the question is, how is this done? And, and why is it done? And what is the uh, purpose of it? What, what does it accomplish? So with that, turn to Matthew chapter 28. Jump to the New Testament to the end of the Gospels, the end of Christ's earthly ministry here before the church, uh, the birth of the church that we're looking at here in, in Acts chapter uh, all of the book of Acts. And we're familiar with this great commission by Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 18. And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of of the age. So we know this as the Great Commission, the, the sending out of Jesus' disciples, which we would also be. And for those that are here that were in the military, military or, or are in the military, you know, you know a commission is not just a, a task to be given, you know, a suggestion to do, it's a command, right? This is a command by Christ uh, to his people, to his disciples, to, to go. And when one makes a, a commission like this, they do it from a position of authority. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. It's been given to me. Go, therefore. And in case you didn't, uh, uh, you know, you missed the connection, what we just read in Second Chronicles when Ez, and, and in Ezra, where Cyrus the king of Persia said, all the kings of the earth of the Lord of God has given me. The Lord God of heaven has given me. It, Cyrus doesn't claim to be, have the authority over all heaven and earth. He says, God has given me the authority on earth. Now, let's go. Let's go to Jerusalem. But Jesus' command is to leave Jerusalem, to, to go into the world, right? So it's almost identical, but there's, a, there's differences that are significant. Jesus said his authority is over heaven and earth to send the church to go out, to be a, a spiritual people, to, to, uh, to the spiritual church. And Cyrus says he has the authority of kings on earth given by the Lord of heaven. To build a physical church, to build a building, a, a place to come into and worship. So God says to his people, come in and now go out. Come in and now go out. I'm thinking, that's all I used to hear from my mom, right? Either come in or go out. Do one another. Just, you're driving me crazy. Come in the house or go out. Just go do something. And you probably all heard the same thing. And now we say it to our kids. It's God saying, come in. And now Jesus says, I'm sending you out. 
So hopefully we see this transition of the, the, the Old Testament history of, uh, of, of God's people and now the, the New Testament work of, of God sending his people out. And it's always about the work of God through his people. The work of God through his people. So just as a, a little further reminder, turn to Acts chapter 1 now. And, and uh, Brian Wright started us out here in this a, a number of months ago. Um, as we see this history uh, unfold, this commission of Christ uh, uh, come to fruition. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Jesus' last words here on earth. Um, and he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Here's this authority again. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So, just before his ascension, Jesus now de defines or details what this in commission entails and, and where to go. And he says, you will be witnesses. And I know Brian spoke of this. It, it's that word martyr that we're more familiar of and that we just studied about uh, of Stephen. And so uh, they're, they're, they're to go to, to their own Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So it's worth noting not just where they're to go, but who is there, right? They begin at Jerusalem, where their, their fellow Jews are, people they would know intimately for the most part. And then they go to Judea, where there's still many of their fellow Jews, but they probably don't know so well. And then they go to Samaria, which consists of, you know, Samaritans who are half Jewish, half Gentile for the most part. And then to the uttermost parts of the earth, where it's mainly Gentiles. Do, do, you, do you see that? Do you see do you see the wisdom of God in the sending out of his people? And I think there's a pattern in their force, uh, especially his parents, that our, our first Jerusalem is what? Our home, our children. It's very easy for us to overlook our children because we're worried about something that's so far out there that God hasn't even called us to, 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 to go to yet. And so to me, there's a pattern. that's another message in and of itself. And what is amazing to me as we get to Acts chapter 8 is we see this very full fulfillment of Jesus' great commission, but it's not in the way that we would think of ourselves and how to accomplish it. Just, just think of the disciples the day after Pentecost. They're sitting around, they're filled with the Holy Spirit now, and they're saying, you remember, Jesus said now, once the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is coming to us, we're supposed to go. How do we do that? What's the best way to do? Maybe, maybe if we put together a, a, a singing team that could go around to different cities and just sing, and people want to come, and they'll love the singing. I'm, I'm not saying anything against singing. I would just say, you know, how, how would you sit down and say, hey, how, let's, this is the way to go. How, how, do, how do we accomplish this? What did Jesus say? He says, you will be witnesses. And that word witness means what? To be a martyr. I don't think that they're necessarily sitting there after thinking, let's go and be martyrs to accomplish this. But do you think they're thinking something different now that they witnessed Stephen, Stephen being a literal martyr for Christ? I, I see God you know, working and directing and showing and affirming to them that this is how it's going to be done. So I don't think their plan, or even ours, to be a witness, a martyr like Stephen, would have included being persecuted. Maybe even to the point of death. That's, when I plan things, it's usually I'm thinking, how can I go do something that's really risky and, and, and possibly be getting killed? I, I'm the opposite of that. Self-preservation is a very strong instinct in me. I, I don't even like to get paper cuts anymore. I'm thinking, how can I protect myself to the greatest degree possible? I, I don't think about, hey, let's go find a way to be persecuted, because that's God's plan. We're, I don't know if you are, but I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, 9, right, where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts, my plans are so much higher in the, than the heavens above the earth than yours. We don't think like God, do we? We don't think in, in a way that he thinks. So the question for us as a, a local New Testament church is, what should we be doing? It is, what are God's thoughts and what are God's plans? How, how would God direct us? And so we should take note at Acts chapter 8 because we, we see a we see God's work. God, we see God's plan. We see God's sovereign wisdom. And you know what? I'm going to send you out, and it's in this way to be witnesses. It's going to be under, under persecution. It's going to be under persecution. So today, as we look at verses 1 through 25, we're going to see this dispersion of Christ's disciples from Jerusalem 
where they're probably really comfortable right now and feeling, you know what, we're, we're starting to gain some traction here. We're, we're not under oppression anymore. We're, we're building up. We're growing. And, but we're going to see this dispersion as they go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then next week as we get to verses 26 through 40, we're going to see Philip as he encounters this Ethiopian eunuch who's going to go back and, and reach people in his own home, the, the uttermost parts of the earth. Do you see that progression? Do you see God's design? Is, is, is God not wise? It's amazing how God accomplishes his plans and purposes in ways that our finite minds can't even, can't even imagine. So if you recall, I entitled our message, The Witness of the Church. Again, it could be used in a, a noun form or a verb form. In the verb form, it could speak of what Jesus' disciples did and what we are to do, just, just to go to be witnesses, speak the gospel, share the gospel, make disciples of others. But it can also be referred to that noun form that we're going to be literally witnesses in, 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 in person where we're going to be persecuted and possibly martyred. Those who spoke of Jesus Christ literally put themselves in a position of being a martyr. They would suffer for the message they shared. That's exactly what we just read about from Stephen in chapter 7. He was a martyr. He was a witness who suffered by being stoned to death for being that witness of the gospel. No other thing. And so now all of Jesus' disciples who are committed to carrying out this great commission to go and be witnesses have to be wondering, is it going to end up just like Stephen? And as we're going to see, they do so in amazing ways. Most of us would be familiar with the, that famous uh, quote by Tertullian, that early church father and theologian, who, who spoke of how uh, persecution actually made the church stronger and grew the church, where he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that was literally fulfilled in Stephen's life. And, I, and, and it's amazing to, to think about what he endured and the very one that was responsible for his death is the one that God would now use to, to multiply his church, to build his church, and to, and to give us half of the New Testament that we read of today. So I wonder, what does that witness in word and in deed and in person look like in my life and yours? So with that, I just want to share three points from these first 25 verses of Acts chapter 8, of these characteristics of, of, of the witness of the church. What does the witness of the church look like? And, it's, 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 and we should understand it's even reflective of, of, of the church today. So just three points. It's just not going to be in three minutes. <laughs> but, um, but we'll get through it. Um, I won't belabor it by any means. So first turn to Acts chapter 8. And just let me read the, the first three verses for us as we see this this first characteristic, and the three, I'll give them to you up front, their, their further persecution, their faithful preaching, and then there's this false profession. Further persecution, faithful preaching, and then we're going to see a false profession. Characteristics we see even within the church today. But number one, this Further persecution. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now Saul was consenting to his death. Speaking of Stephen. At that time, a great persecution rose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, don't miss that. Could you imagine if that was going on today? Do, do you think we'd be talking a little bit about it? Do you think maybe we would have been so bold to come to church today? Do you think it would have changed our conversation uh, and our sharing of the gospel at work or in the neighborhood this week? I mean, think about what's going on, what we just read. So immediately in verse 1, we see this continuing persecu persecution uh, and, and now it's on steroids. I mean, it's just, it's been, it's been amped up. And again, the person behind it we're going to see is Saul, that we know as Paul. And I used to think uh, in the stoning of Stephen that Saul was just this innocent bystander that really just didn't know what was going on. He's kind of a novice Pharisee, and, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, familiar with, you know, how you stone people and, you know, what kind of rocks you get in and all. I, I just think, you know, he was kind of there, guilty by association. And that's why they all threw their cloaks uh, at his feet. 
But if you read this, and if you read the context of what we just read here, and as we see in chapter 9, verse 1, it, it was Stephen or Saul who was the one who likely encouraged or even initiated the stoning of Stephen. Even in his young age as a Pharisee, but he, he was zealous, he, he was passionate. So we see here by the context of verse 1 that Saul was consenting to his death. In other words, he was giving approval for it. In, in Acts chapter 22 and verses 19 20, Paul gives his own account and he, uh, he confesses it. You know, th- th- yeah, this was him. He said, Lord, they know uh, that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And that word consenting there, it doesn't mean say, yeah, go ahead, that's fine by me, I rubber stamp it, go, go do it. it. It means to be pleased. It means to give approval. It actually speaks of someone who's standing there giving applause for what's going on. Stephen wasn't holding the cloaks. They were at his feet because he's probably doing this while they're stoning Stephen. Can can you see why there was some hesitancy by the the disciples when Saul became Paul? He came to Christ and he came to him and said, hey, I'm I'm one of you now. (laughs) And they're all saying, we've seen you clapping. We've seen you cheering on when... Stephen, our brother in Christ, was stoned. And Saul's persecution of the church was not just this one day or one week event where he had nothing else better to do. He was passionate about it. This was his, a continual zeal, zealous mission to literally exterminate all the Christians of the day. Because as we get to Acts chapter 9, and uh, just remind you, verse 1 it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. This is his life's mission. Everything he thinks about, everything he breathes, exhales, and and speaks about is ways to exterminate these Christians. So would you say this is just a a bad day for the church, or would you say this is great persecution on the church? I would say it's great persecution. Persecution that none of us are even familiar with. But thankfully, as we'll get to, we see in God's sovereign grace and mercy, he chooses Saul to salvation, and he uses them in a mighty way. And again, it all began with the death of Stephen. So back to Acts chapter 8. In verse 3, we read that Saul was making havoc in the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women to prison. And the word havoc, it's, it's a violent picture. It's actually a picture, it's a word that describes a, a, an animal, a wild animal who just grabs its prey and tears it and just rips it apart just so it can consume it. That's the word that Luke, inspired by God, uses to to describe this this act and these actions and the mindset of Saul and others uh, uh, upon the church. It's a word that, with connotations of disrespect and dishonor and shame to to the prey, of humiliation. That's exactly what Saul sought to do, to humiliate these Christians and to ravage and ruin their testimony, and he thoroughly enjoyed doing it. We need to understand that. And notice that he's doing this to both men and women. And so it's, it's affecting the whole family. He's dragging men and women to, to prison. What, what's going on with the children? I mean, this, this, is, this is devastating work that he's doing to these families, these Christian families. And, but even in Saul's zeal, his persecution to, to do this, uh, I'm reminded of what Joseph spoke about to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50. What you meant for evil, God means for what? Good. Here Saul thinks he's in complete control. I'm actually doing the work of the Lord. And no, God is sovereign. He's even going to use this, this hatred Paul has, Saul has for the church to, for his glory, for his honor, to accomplish his purposes. He's going to use Saul to scatter the church, to fulfill the commission of Jesus to go now, to go to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He's going to use Saul in that. So it's critical for us to understand this, perse- this picture of this persecution of the church that's a, in direct relationship to the persecution of who first? Christ. Jesus said, when they persecute you, they persecute who? Me. As we get to Acts chapter 9, he's going to say to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting the church? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? Me. We should be 
understanding of that. Hold your finger there if you would, but turn to John chapter 15. There's so much we could speak about in, in this regard. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. Jesus speaking, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose, chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I spoke to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will what? Also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours also. Let me read verse 20. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. But it's interesting that Jesus goes right on then to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit of God, the helper. That even though I'm gone, and now they're not persecuting me, they're persecuting you, you can endure. You can have comfort because the Holy Spirit of God will indwell you. So they're, in a sense, they're still persecuting Christ, right? Because Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit uh, of God. So it's critical for us to understand this correlation that when we're persecuted as God's people, they're ultimately they're seeking to persecute Christ. And we actually read in Acts chapter 8 that this was great persecution. It's something that I'm sure that none of us have, have ever endured. But we, again, we could take great comfort in, even if we are, even if we are persecuted for Christ's sake, God is faithful. He'll give, never give us more than we're able to do, endure. So again, there's, a, there's so much we could speak about in regards to salvation, so, uh, persecution, but the goal is to see that this actually furthered the gospel. It didn't hinder it. So when persecution comes, when opposition comes, we should embrace it. We should know that God is aware of this. This, may, this could even be part of God's sovereign plan whatever you and I are involved in. And it's worth noting, as we read here, that the apostles, the leaders of the church, they remained in Jerusalem during this dispersion, in this great persecution. And they were the ones that most, were most likely to, to be martyred and persecuted like Stephen, yet they weren't fearful. They were faithful. They remained in Jerusalem. Again, I think there's a, a pattern, an example, a lesson for us to learn, especially as men and husbands in our homes and our families, to remain faithful. To, to not be fearful. And it's also worth noting about Stephen's burial that it spoke about that devout men carried Stephen to his burial and they made great lamentation over him. And it's, it's worth noting because uh, for someone who was stoned to death under Jewish law, they were not to receive a proper burial. And no one was allowed to mourn over their death. This person was totally disregarded like they didn't even exist. They should not be acknowledged. But devout men, this speaks of men who were popular, men who were well-known, who, who were so moved by Stephen's faithfulness, his martyrdom, his witness for Christ, that they were going to honor him in his death. Great lamentation was over him. They didn't fear the persecution. They didn't fear the possible being martyred themselves. They were encouraged. They were spurred on. By that. And I wonder how often do, do we encourage, does our boldness, does our faithfulness, uh, does our witness encourage others? And again, we're just reminded that God's plans are so much higher than ours, and we need to be careful to question God's sovereignty. Because I think of Stephen, I think, man, what an impact he could have had if, in, in his speaking, in his ability, in his, in his zeal, just to live this long life. You know, why would God call him home? Well, think about how God did use Stephen's life, his short life, and what he accomplished through Paul. So our first point, our first characteristic of the witness of the church is this further persecution that we see. And my question to us is, what persecution have you endured? Or that you're currently enduring? Is there a Saul in your life? Is there, is there a trial? Is there a difficulty in your life? Maybe it's, maybe it's this COVID-19 uh, pandemic we find ourselves in. Is it a difficult situation that we find ourselves in? And are we going to focus on that persecution? Or are we going to be faithful? And, and I know it's, it's, it's not been fun, and you know we've been inconvenienced, and we haven't been able to do this and been able to do that. But if you had to choose between what we're going through now or being part of that New Testament church, I don't think it'd be a hard choice, would it? What they are at risk of enduring. So I, I just pray that we would focus on what the result of our persecution, our trial, our inconveniences might be that we might faithfully endure. 
Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Persecution. He doesn't promise us a rose garden. He doesn't promise us a day at Disneyland. I love Disneyland. <laughs> I enjoy it. But it, that, that's not what the Christian life is called to be at all times, is it? We're called to suffer persecution. So this persecution, this further persecution, this great persecution had escalated and led to the dispersion of the Jewish Christians of the day. The seed of the church had been planted. And now it begins to, to, to grow into Judea and Samaria. And as we'll see next week, into the uttermost parts of the earth. And again, it was all watered by the blood of Stephen the martyr. And this persecution, this great persecution, it leads to our second characteristic, which is faithful preaching. Not hide in a, in a, in a cave, not run away and, and not be cowardly, uh, not be, you know, protect yourselves and, and keep yourselves. It was, they went out and faithfully preached the word of God, the very thing that Stephen was martyred for. Acts chapter 8, let me read verses 4 through 8. Therefore, those who, grew, uh, who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Remember, they're, they're scattered because of this persecution by Saul. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Paul, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. Verse 8, And there was great joy in that city. There's great joy in the midst of great persecution. I mean, think about it. it it's... It's amazing. So this faithful preaching by Philip and others, these men and women who were dragged off in, to, to prison, they're now scattered abroad and they're faithfully preaching the very word that could jeopardize their lives. The very thing that Saul and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the day were trying to, to, to extinguish actually did what? It multiplied. It grew. Tertullian was right. Persecution causes growth in the church. They assumed that by killing just one person, Stephen, who spoke boldly in the name of Christ, they could put an end to this witness. What they actually did was created many witnesses to many different areas. And it caused great boldness in all the disciples to fill this great commission that Christ had given to them. We read several times in the past, and when we were in book, uh, book, uh, Acts chapter 4, of the boldness of the apostles. They prayed for boldness to be faithful witnesses and, and preachers of the gospel. And I would suggest that some of us, and, and myself included, could use a, a healthy dose of holy boldness to be faithful in being witness. In Acts 4, 29, they prayed this, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. The desire of their heart was, in spite of the threats, in spite of the persecutions, they would speak boldly, regardless of that. The disciples not only prayed for their own boldness, but they prayed for the boldness of the other servants of the Lord. And again, there's a pattern for us. To be, be diligent in praying for our boldness and the boldness of others, especially during these threats. And I couldn't help but think about how God had used um, the fear of him with Ananias and Sapphira uh, as they lied to the Holy Spirit, God, to show how, how serious he was about sin that led to their death. And that, that fear of God's judgment upon sin. But now God uses this death of Stephen to bring fear, this, this awe, this boldness of the Christians to be faithful in the work that he was called them to do. So we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, Therefore, those who were scared went everywhere preaching the word. All of them, men and women, whoever it was, disciples of Christ. People that would never have been reached out to unless there was this great persecution. This is a spiritual revival. Just like as we read throughout church history, the spiritual revivers that, that are of God. The people, are, people change, people are, have come and gone, but God is the same. And his word is the same. And he, he revives his people. And many times in throughout, throughout church history, it's all under persecution. And then Luke defines a little bit more here in his record for us of the faithful preaching of one individual, uh, Philip. 
And it's not the, the Philip the Apostle. This is Philip that we spoke about in Acts chapter 6 as one of the deacons. And in Acts chapter 21, he's actually called an evangelist, uh, one who shares uh, the good news. So here's these two deacons, uh, Stephen and, and Philip, who are just not deacons and serving the, the needs, but God uses them as also as great ministers of the gospel, great uh, evangelists uh, to speak uh, his truth. And we're all called to be evangelists. So maybe not in the same context like Billy Graham, but we all have our own Jerusalem. And we start there. And, and we have our Judea, the, the places we work into and the places we go and in our Samarias and maybe even the uttermost parts of the earth. But may we be these same faithful witnesses. And it might be in the context of persecution. But if we share to fail the, uh, we fail to share the gospel um, when there's no persecution, we're, we're never going to share it when there is persecution. Not, well, yeah, God can do anything through us, right? Uh, but I pray that we just take that opportunity and, and be bold in our faith even when we're not enduring persecution and, and start there. And verse 6 there in chapter 8 tells us that, uh, that the multitudes obeyed the things Philip preached. And I have to believe this speaks of their obedience and, and their saving faith because look at the result in verse 8. There was great joy. And it always seems to be the, de the defining response of someone when they come to salvation in Christ, isn't it? There's this, this renewed joy. Because they, they know something new. They know this freedom, this release from bondage for the first time. And, and there's true joy. I mean, even Jesus spoke of that in Luke 15, 7. He said, I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who need no repentance. So I hope you caught what we read about what Philip was doing. He was doing the very same things as Stephen did that led to a stoning. These signs and miracles and, and wonders and this faithful preaching. And the ability of Stephen and, and Philip to do this uh, and the other apostles just segues to this, this next characteristic, this last characteristic I want to look at this morning. And, and, and we'll do so just briefly here. Um, but just to remind us, the church was characterized by further pre persecution, faithful preaching, but now as we see, there's these false professions. And one in particular here of Simon the sorcerer. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the whole passage. I just want to draw out a, a couple observations that I think are very important because we're going to use it next week as we contrast it, this, this false profession of, of Simon the sorcerer to the, the true profession, the true confession of Christ by this Ethiopian eunuch. They stand in total contrast uh, to one another. And there's certainly much we could look at more here in the, in the faithful preaching of Peter uh, and of Philip and the, and the message, but I think it's worth noting, and it's important to understand, this, this characteristic of false profession that was in the early church that we even see today. And understand, this isn't just someone who comes in and, um, you know, and, just, and walks out and has no effect. I believe very much like Ananias and Sapphira, this, this is Satan's attack on the church from the inside. What did Peter say to Ananias and Sapphira? Why has who? Satan filled your heart. You think Satan understands the church and what's going on and God's work and God's plan? Without a doubt. And I'm not a paranoid person. I don't walk around like, you know, where's... The... But Satan's alive and active and at work. Is he not or you and do, you, do you think he knows what's going on in the context of God's church and the local church and, and, the, and God's church at why? Uh, he, yes. And so we should be aware of that. So here we have this Simon the sorcerer, and there's much debate about, you know, what's his, was he truly a Christian because it says he was baptized, he, he believed, and, and, and I don't think we can be dogmatic by what's given here because we don't know the end of the story, do we? I pray that he is. It sounds like we get to the end there. He says to Simon, you know, you know pray for me. I, I don't want this judgment. I, I pray that it was sincere, but we don't know. I, I wouldn't be dogmatic about his salvation one way or another based on this passage. But what we do know, he, you know, he, he was someone who was truly endowed by Satan because uh, it uh, speaks of this sorcery. I mean, this is, this is witchcraft. This, this is real stuff without elaborating a whole lot. This just wasn't hocus pocus sleight of hand. This is spiritual warfare, and we see it within the church. And you've got to appreciate the boldness of Peter to point it out and to call it out. But what we need to note here, and this is the one thing I want to emphasize, is why I say it, I would believe this is, in, right in this point, in this context of this passage, that it's a false profession, is because we don't see this change in Simon's life. 
And we need to be so reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if someone's in Christ, they continue to be the same person? No, they're what? They're a new creation. No, they don't immediately become sinless. They're not perfectly sanctified. But you see that progression. You see that change in their life. You might see that joy. You might see that, you know, no longer uh, enslaved to certain uh, sin and, and behaviors. And you see the boldness. And you see the desire and hunger for God's word and to be around God's people. But what Peter speaks of about Simon here is that he's still greedy. And that uh, he, he just wants to have this same power that they do for, for attention and, and, and for glory from people. I, I would encourage you just, you know, read verses 9 through 25 on your own if you can to, to, to get the context. But we need to be aware there's false profession within the church. And it's our responsibility to, to watch and to be careful and to, to, and to see that and to, and to know that. Because it was certainly true here. It certainly exists even today. But again, there's that hope in verse 24 where Simon answers and says, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. But look at just this continued result of the further persecution and the faithful preaching in verse 25. In spite of false professions and Satan's work, attempted work within the church, verse 25, So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. The disciples grew in boldness and in number and faithfulness. And it was all part of God's plan. And so, to summarize, there, because there's numerous characteristics of the New Testament church that were true then, that are, should be true of us today, and the ones we spoke of today, this further pre- persecution, this faithful preaching, and even these false professions, the questions we need to ask ourselves are this. Who is in your Jerusalem? Because your Jerusalem is different from mine. Who's your, your direct responsibility to, to share the gospel with, to, to make disciples of? And the second question is, how are you enduring persecution? Are you avoiding it? Are you just trying to, you know, protect yourself? Do you go into safe mode? Or are you faithful? Are you fearless? Or are you fearful? I mean, it's, I, yeah, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm a bigger person. I have a lot of people say, boy, you're, you're intimidating. You, you don't know how easy it is for me to be intimidated by people and to be fearful in, about what they're going to think of me if I say certain things. Now, I don't know if that's true of you. I, I say it, it might be at some time. If I can be very fr- I don't like rejection. I don't go around like, who can I offend and get rejected today? But if I'm going to walk in truth, if I'm going to be a faithful witness for Christ, I better speak truth, and it's not going to be well received by everyone. I understand that. And, and I can walk in fear more than faith at times. Are you enduring that persecution? Do you pray for boldness? Or do we just rely on our own strength and say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm an outgoing person, I'm well-spoken, I can do this. I can do. I, we, can, we need to be so dependent on God's leading and the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit of God and to be sensitive to that and to be faithful and, and not to be overzealous and not to be, and be easily intimidated. We just, we just need to be faithful in what we've called to do. So let's pray for one another. Pray for us to have the boldness. Are you a faithful witness for Jesus Christ in the gospel? If so, then go. That's what we've been called to do. And it might be in persecution. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that you have called us out. You called us by name. You drew us unto yourself. And it has nothing to do with who we are or what we bring to the table. But you did it in your mercy and your grace because we were sinful people condemned to eternal death and damnation apart from you. So thank you for adopting us. Thank you for making us your own, your people in your church. And I pray that we would be faithful. I pray that we would have the boldness to be the witness that you have called each and every one of us to be. Father, do a work in our hearts and minds. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ, this church family. 
God, I pray that in the days ahead, we would be a beacon, a light to this community, to the city, to the state, to the world of who you are. May we be the witness of your church. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So thank you for joining us. Pray you have a blessed week. Please remember to wear your masks on your way out. Go in his grace.